Yeah. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this workshop about the DDI cross-domain integration or the DDI CDI. This workshop is going to introduce the draft specification using some examples that are some are made up and some are real life examples. My name is Hilde Orten. I work at Norwegian Center for Research Data, where I am engaged in metadata related tasks. And I also do some work for the DDI Alliance. For example, I'm a member of the DDI CDI development team, and the controlled vocabularies group, and also the DDI training group. And with me, I have also uh, Arafan Gregory. Arafan, can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, I'm a consultant. I've been working with, with uh, the DDI Alliance since the beginning of DDI Lifecycle. I've done a lot of implementing of codebook. In general, I work with international standards. My day job, if I have one, is mostly these days working with, with CoData, um, organizing a thing called the Decadal Program. I'll be presenting on that uh, tomorrow. Um, but I have a background in technology and then in standards around data and research, basically. Okay, and before we start, it's Arafan who is going to, uh, to start the introduction here, but before he explains the, the program and starts that, I just uh, explain a little bit about our procedures here today. The webinar is going to be recorded and we want you, when we are presenting, we want you to uh, post any questions in using the question and answer tool. And then at certain important steps in the workflow, we'll go through the questions and, and try to answer to them. And uh, then um, we will try to answer the questions um, as they are written, but sometimes we would need to, to ask perhaps the person in more detail. And then Alina would need to make you a panelist but if you are not interested in that, that we, we ask you to clarify or something, then just send a little chat to Alina that you would not like to, to be panelist, and then she will keep track of that. So I think that's it. And uh, then I give the word to Arafan to start to introduce our program for the day and the DDI CDI. Arafan please. So hello, everybody. A quick outline of what we're going to be covering in the workshop. A um, little bit of introduction and background, what DDI CDI is, how we created it and why, how it came to be. Um, most of this workshop is going to be focused on some example constructs from the DDI CDI model in a number of areas. We're going to look at foundational metadata and um, then data description. We are going to try to do some hands-on exercises, which is tricky online. You'll see how well we do. You're, we're going to kind of use you as guinea pigs for that. Um, and then we're going to um, look at process and provenance um, in DDI, CDI. And after each of these, uh, the big areas will be able to, um, to, to answer questions and so on. Um, and a little bit of summary at the end. We'll be taking a break somewhere in the middle so that people um, can get something to drink or go to the bathroom or have a cigarette or whatever. Um, so without further ado, the introduction and background. I'm gonna start this off because of the Eddy theme this year with the discussion of FAIR. Now FAIR is probably the most amazing marketing phenomenon related to data ever. People, everyone's talking about FAIR data and it's important. They've done an amazing job of highlighting the idea of, of sharing and reusing data. And I think that's, that's they've done the world a huge service. But when people talk about FAIR, they talk a lot about finding data. They talk a lot about accessing data, not so much about interoperability and reuse because they're the expensive hard part. Um, and the problem with FAIR is that you need all of it. If you can't do anything with the data you've found, What's the point? It's just frustrating. Um, and you, so you need to be able to, to reuse data. You need to be able to work with the data that you've accessed. And DDI-CDI primarily focuses on interoperability and reuse in terms of FAIR. 
It is also quite useful for data discovery, but fundamentally it's about data integration and about being able to reuse data and understanding what it is. And that is um, so just to sort of position this work in terms of FAIR. Um, these are metadata intensive things. And very often in the past, metadata and data infrastructure for data management hasn't been the focus of a lot of research funding because the sexy part of research is discovering some great new thing. It's not supporting other people doing research. And yet, when you look at the world today and when you look at what FAIR data claims to support, that infrastructure and that metadata are absolutely critical. And so FAIR in many ways demands that we do better and more of what we've always done. Um, and DDI-CDI is, is hopefully a part of that solution. You may be familiar, presumably you are, with DDI Codebook and DDI Lifecycle. And these are good granular XML specifications for the social, behavioral, and economic sciences, SBE. And that's sort of an American term I know, but um, we all know the general DDI community and they're pretty generic so that other fields that deal with similar data like national level official statistics, public health data can also use those specifications. Um, the terminology is not so familiar, but the models work for them. And so we've seen adoption of, of the DDI specifications, Codebook and Lifecycle in those areas. Um, DDI-CDI is actually completely different. It's a specification for going across domain boundaries, which means that it is not a domain specification. It's not only an SBE specification. It's intended to be used across all kinds of domains. And I mean crystallography. I mean earth sciences. Very, very different things. Because of that, it has to deal with a lot of different types of data, different kinds of models. And the terminology tends to be more general, which is to say more abstract. And when you start going cross domain, terminology becomes an issue because everybody is going to hate your terms. And that's just the way it is. You don't have a domain, a culture to work inside of the way that DDI always has. Um, and so it might be a little challenging to people, but um, it's just a, sort of the nature of the beast. We have to deal with the cross domain standards, so we have to try to be as generic as possible. Um, because DDI-CDI is meant to work across domains, it is intended to work with many, many other standards, both within our domain and outside of it. And so you, you may run into some acronyms you're not tremendously familiar with in this presentation. Mm -hmm. Certainly, um, we're having to work with some new things that we had never seen before in working on, on CDI. Little bit of the history here. Two years ago at this conference, I think it was in Berlin, it was in Berlin, um, there was a discussion. It was, it was not an official discussion. It was sort of a side meeting. People had been working on the DDI-4, DDI moving forward, or DDI core. There were all kinds of, of different terms being used um, on the model that DDI was producing. And they'd been working hard for a long time. Very, very good work. But nothing had come out of it that was a product, if you will. There was no single useful implementable output. There had been a prototype, there were in fact two prototypes that were released and they were interesting and good in many ways, but they weren't things that you could take and implement for an intended purpose. And there was a lot of frustration within the Alliance around that fact because there's so much work had gone on and so many resources had been poured into this um, in time and energy and no one had anything definite in their hands. So an agreement was made that in a one year time frame there should be an implementation of the DDI-4 model that was implementable and useful for something. And the group that was going to make that happen was the modeling representation and testing group. I'm sort of the, the acting chair, the convener of that group. Hilda's one of the organizers. You probably know Akim Vakaro, who is the other one. Um, but Akim really pulled that group together in very early, in January of 2019. And we gave ourselves about a year to finish a specification, which is now DDI-CDI. Um, and we the, the timeline was not to have it in production, but simply to have the specification in hand, which we by and large did. Um, the intention was to base that work on real world use cases. And we came up with, with a couple of good ones. If you're involved in, in um, 
the the in-depth network, you may have heard of the alpha network. In-depth was a, a, a network of health and demographic surveillance sites in low and middle income countries. And they, these things started cropping up in the 60s and 70s. And, and the in-depth network was a network of different sites, and they were all independent, doing things like population statistics and health statistics, births, deaths, um, in countries that didn't have census, most of them. And that was pretty high value data, but it was an informal network and the alpha network grew out of it as a way of having a more disciplined, more rigorous data sharing among a subset of the in-depth sites in Eastern and Southern Africa focused on HIV research. And this was pre-COVID and now they're beginning to look at COVID obviously, but um, they were, a lot of them were using DDI Codebook and the IHSN toolkit and um, they joined because they wanted to capture the provenance information about the site level data that was different, but it was being turned into a harmonized data set published out of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And so there were changes made to the data as it was harmonized and the researchers wanted to know what they were because a lot of the researchers at the sites themselves were trying to use data from other sites at the same time. And the harmonized data site looked different than what they were familiar with. Um, so they became an implementation case for us. You may know Larry Hoyle from University of Kansas. He had been leading a project with some other um, institutions internationally, looking at generating our libraries for working not only with um, Lifecycle or Codebook, but all versions of DDI. And they had implemented the DDI4 model, the prototype. And so they became a test case for the DDI CDI work because a lot of a lot of DDI implementations involve R increasingly. And so that was seen as, as an interesting test case. Another one was at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. They were looking at, um, at time series and indicators. Uh, the La Bureau of Labor Statistics does a lot of survey data collection about, about employment and prices and so on and the US economy. But at the end of the day, they produce data for policymakers in the form of time series. And they were, they were undergoing an activity where they were modeling time series and relating that back to the microdata. And so they became a test case for implementing that part of the DDI CDI model. There were some other minor cases, but these were real actual implementations. And we were using them to drive our requirements and drive our, our work. We wanted to make it real. It was a small group. We had nine members. There was no turnover. It was pretty impressive. We met at least once a week for more than a year, sometimes as many as three or four meetings a week. So this was a very intensive effort and it's sort of gonna, gonna reconvene in the, in the new year um, after we're finished doing webinars, I'll talk about that. But people stayed very focused and they stayed very disciplined, which if you know these people um, is not always the case. Um, we had a sprint in the margins of Natty in 2019 and in Ottawa at, at StatsCan. We had a sprint in Dagstuhl in October of 2019. We would have had another this year, but that sadly COVID intervened. Um, but we had a public release in April of 2020. So a little bit after we were hoping, but not too much after. So that public release, release is now up for review and it ought to become a production specification early next year. So sometime in the first half of 2021. Um, COVID has sadly delayed the schedule a bit. What we've been doing most actively recently are a series of webinars to reach out to different groups of users in different domains, different technical areas. So far, we've done seven of these and we've talked to about 250 people, maybe more than that. And we've had some follow-up meetings. Um, we have some more webinars planned. There's one next Wednesday, which was gonna be focused on process and provenance. Um, there's an organization, CoData, um, who is going to be, I think, if they're not already, the newest member of the DDI Alliance. Um, and they are uh, the, a branch of the International Science Council that focuses on data issues. And they've identified DDI CDI and DDI generally as of interest to them. And they helped us do these webinars. Now, what they brought to the party was a lot of contacts in domains that weren't social science. But they also were very supportive with um, secretarial help. They let us use their, their uh, webinar platform. They were really great. And um, they helped us run these webinars. And that's 
allowed us to connect with a lot of people in a lot of different areas, get them to critique the specification and give us feedback, which has re resulted in a number of changes. And that's an ongoing process. Um, throughout this effort, we've tried to be good citizens in terms of the DDI Alliance. So working with the management and the executive board, with the technical committee, marketing, um, with training a bit. Um, so being part of the whole DDI Alliance team has been an emphasis here because DDI CDI really touches on all those different areas. And we have to coordinate with Lifecycle and, and Codebook. So we work with the technical committee, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we've, we've done our best there. It's not always easy. There are a lot of groups in DDI. Here we are, most of us. You probably know Oliver Hopp at uh, GASIS or Wendy Thomas from the um, Population Center at University of Minnesota. Um, they're not here, they couldn't make the meeting. But um, there we are, um, the gang of nine or seven in this case on the steps at Dagstool. So that, that was quite fun. There's Hilda in the front. She's the bald one with the check shirt. No, that's not you, Hilda. Um, no, 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 we know who Hilda is. And, and you probably know most of these people. So Akim and Dan, Larry Hoyle, who I talked about a second ago. There's me, Jay, Hilda, and Flavio Rizzolo from um, StatsCan. So it was a pretty good team of people, all in, heavily involved in the, the DDI4 moving forward work. Um, it was interesting as we went through the, the standard, um, through the process of trying to, to build this sort of standard model and going through the, the DDI4 standard. Um, because we thought that what we were working on was a replacement for DDI lifecycle, a next generation DDI lifecycle that was model driven. And not the whole thing, but a core. And that expectation changed. And it changed because we were using real world use cases. Because the implementations didn't want to replace lifecycle. They didn't want to replace codebook. They were happy with those specifications for what they did. They had other requirements. And what DDI CDI ended up being was a companion piece, a supplement to those standards in the projects we looked at. Um, the idea is that there were lots of kinds of metadata, lots of new ways of describing data and provenance that were necessary that DDI Codebook and DDI Lifecycle didn't really cover. And that a lot of those things were coming out of the need for better data integration. Um, a lot of domains now need better data integration tools within their own domains and across domain boundaries. That's true of our community, but it's true of almost every other domain today. Um, and so that's what DDI CDI ended up being focused on. And um, I, feel, I feel like that was a very positive change from our initial expectation because we didn't really need a new life cycle. Life cycle is a good piece of work. We didn't need a new code book. It's a good standard. What we needed was more of the same doing some different things. Think about the real world for a minute. And I think you'll all recognize, I'm not gonna describe this very well maybe, but I think you'll recognize what I'm talking about. What we're seeing in the world today are larger research projects. COVID has brought this home like nothing else. People really, really need data coming from all over the map in these very large scale projects um, to solve very difficult problems. And um, increasingly that's true, not only for the, the crisis of the day, but across the board. Funders are going, to, going after bigger projects with the intention of sharing the data afterwards. We're dealing with more data and that data is coming from more different sources. Um, and part of that is because we have the ability to do it. We have supercomputers, we have big data technology, we have the bandwidth to do really impressive things. And we're beginning to have approaches for analyzing that data and working with it, things like machine learning um, that allow us to deal with huge amounts of data. And when you take mm -hmm. machine learning as an example, it doesn't just, enable you to work with lots amount of lots of data it it requires lots of data it's a data hungry technology and there are different examples of, of those sort of big data approaches but the point is the technology isn't the problem anymore we have good bandwidth we have good computing power we have good approaches the problem is the data itself and knowing what it is um, and what you see is a requirement for more complete machine actionable metadata because of the sheer volume of data in some ways. And you need to know more about it. When you're dealing with data that comes from outside your own domain, you don't know the PI from the project that produced it. You don't know the literature. There's lots of things you don't have about the context of the semantics of the data provenance. 
and you need that to work with the data. <coughs> so DDI CDI was aimed a bit at that. Um, we're dealing a lot with new formats of data and new structures that have to be described so they can be integrated with the with the kinds of data that we're using for analysis. And I think we're seeing that requirement in a lot of archives, a lot of, of, of different places today. And there's, it seems like people are inventing new technologies for working with data at an increased pace. It's not just XML anymore. It's not just JSON or Python or whatever the, the technology of, of the day is. These things keep coming along and they keep being better, but you've got to support them. And that's, that's a, a difficult requirement for a standard. So DDI CDI is not a replacement for DDI Codebook or Lifecycle. It's meant to be used in combination with them. It adds support for describing new kinds of data. And we'll talk a lot about that. So not just rectangular data, not just n cubes derived from the microdata, but many other things as well. We've always had the ability to describe processing and associate it with certain functions in DDI, particularly in lifecycle. And that um, has become much more comprehensive support around process and provenance at a detailed level. And we'll get into that a bit towards the end of the workshop. Um, it gives you a detailed description of how integration can take place between different types of data sets. And um, that's an important um, thing in this day and age. And, and, and we'll get a bit into that. Talks about um, how DDI can be applied in new domains and disciplines. So um, it's not that we're applying the old DDI to new domains, it's that data coming from other domains or our data being used by other domains is more accessible if it's described in DDI CDI. So it becomes an integration tool. It helps you manage um, data that you didn't used to have to manage that's in different formats, um, things like that. So DDI CDI is really a, a change within the overall product suite and a pretty significant one. The goals that, um, that we set ourselves were these. First, to create a useful implementable product in a, in a fairly short time frame, And that was a given from the starting gate. Um, we had to think about modern systems that work with a lot of other standards and other models because nobody implements DDI in isolation really. And that's less and less true as things go on. Um, so we need to comply with a bunch of different things, schema.org, DCAT, you know, different kinds of ontologies, Dublin Core, whatever it was. There's lots of standards out there that are, that are related to data. And um, you may be familiar with Pravo or Prov, um, for describing provenance, those were the kinds of models we had to deal with. And so we created DDI CDI with that in mind. The idea was not to replace other standards, although sometimes you have to duplicate some of the information they contain. It was really to align with other standards and to leverage what was already there so that we could fill in the gaps. And that's what we used our test cases to really show us where were the gaps and what needed doing. Um, we have a very interesting orientation in describing data, and it's a very important, and Hilda will talk more about this in a bit. It's called the datum-oriented approach, or datum, uh, I guess that's really the word we use for it. Datum is not a word that rolls naturally out of off your tongue, but it's a very important idea. You need to be able to track things at the level of a single data point, because the data point is the thing that gets reused throughout the life cycle, throughout the provenance chain. And it changes and it becomes other data points, but you need to understand those relationships. People don't reuse entire data sets a lot of the time. They pull selections of data out of other data sets. And um, you need to be able to manage the data at the level of each data point and to understand the roles that it plays in different structures, different formats, different processes. And that's a very big order, but that's what we, that's the orientation that the DDI4 model took and we very much use that orientation in DDI CDI. It's a very powerful thing. Um, for process and provenance, we weren't after an ability to describe literally each line of code in, in an, an SPSS script or a stata do file or an R file. What we really needed was the packaging that showed you how a set of processes fit together to do something at a business level, at the business process level. And so, we really relied on other standards that give you the lower level of that and tied them together and connected them to the data. And that becomes the important part of what DDI-CDI does in the, um, 
in the process area. So those were really our goals and what we set out to do. Hopefully we did, you can tell us. Um, when you talk about domain independence, that's a very complicated thing. Um, we say that DDI CDI should be usable in any domain. And that's a, that's a, a, a very large claim. We hope it's true. We tried to make it true. Um, what we did was we focused on the structure of data and the generic aspects of the things that, that about data that, that can, be, can be understood across domain boundaries. We are not talking about domain ontologies because those are very domain specific. We're not talking about data life cycles because those are domain specific. Um, we're talking about what is the structure of your data and what can we, what can we agree about so that we understand each other even though we don't share life cycles, we don't share experimental designs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you end up with generic elements like variables of different types and classifications and so on. And a lot of these are familiar things because we use them too, but everybody uses these things, even the, if the terminology is not always familiar. Um, ultimately, we wanted to produce something that was a complement to life cycle and well aligned with it. And I think we, do, I think we managed to do that. It's pretty clear if you understand lifecycle to see how it plugs into DDI, CDI. Um, at the end of the day, we needed to be able to combine data coming from different domains. And I think, we, I think we've proven that that can be done. It is very different from lifecycle and codebook in that this is not an XML standard first. It's really a formal UML class model. Now, there are a lot of reasons for that. One of them is that technology implementation varies massively by domain. So to be domain independent, you couldn't be bound to XML. That's very common in our domain, not everywhere. Um, in a lot of places they use RDF. In some places they're still using flat files and C++, et cetera, et cetera. It's completely different in other domains. Um, and their data reflects that. So the way to, to make yourself technology proof is to model things in UML and to have a very rigorous formal model. So we have a class UML model. UML can express other things um, as well. And it's based on a strict subset of the features. Um, that's important because UML is capable of doing a lot of very complicated things. And we tried to avoid some of the, the less well-supported features of that standard. Um, there's a thing called XMI, which is an XML language for describing and exchanging UML models between tools that work with UML. And there's a subset of XMI that is a very well-supported um, collection of the XMI features. And um, we did a bunch of research and talked to the canonical XMI people at OMG to determine what XMI we should use to describe our subset of UML. And OMG is the standards body that, that produces all of these things. Um, and I think we came up with a very, very good solution there that there are lots of tools that will take your UML and represent in whatever syntax or platform you're going to use for technology-wise technology to turn the UML into a representation in that syntax, which means that the DDI Alliance doesn't have to do it. Um, Akim right now I, or, or today is teaching a workshop on this very subject, um, which is for developers, granted, but it means that you have, if you have a UML model, you don't need to have a binding into every possible syntax platform that you can actually, um, we, we provide an XML one and we may do an RDF one, we're working on that, but we're not going to try to, to support every platform because UML tools already allow us to do that. UML also future proofs the standard in a certain way. Yes, if, if new technologies come along, you can bind UML into those technologies. So it guarantees us a little bit of, of longevity into the future. But UML is also by its nature an extensible modeling format so that we can very likely add things to our model without invalidating the pieces that we've already done. And that's important. And UML is very much oriented to work that way. And so for a lot of reasons, the UML model is an important aspect. The primary deliverable from DDI CDI is the model, not the XML. And that's a big change. So here's a picture of boxes and arrows and um, should be familiar to most of you. This is a sort of uh, simplified generic life cycle where you have some raw data, maybe sensor data, maybe 
survey answers, something in its raw form coming in, and you process that into analyzable microdata. You might do some data cleaning, you might do some recodes, things like that. And you end up with a unit record data set or something that's analyzable, unit record data set in this example. Um, you do your analysis and that very often would include tabulations and you end up with an aggregate data set or a data cube, um, which can in some situations, and, and this is typical of official statistics, be further um, processed into indicators. And when I say indicators, think of the sustainable development goal indicators. These very highly defined agreed data points that are tracked over time, deeply aggregate, often aggregates of aggregates. Um, and so you have a series of different forms of your data that exist more or less similar, and they're connected by very specific processes that can be described and understood. DDI-CDI wants to describe the, the structures of each of those data sets, the roles that the datums play within them, and the processes that connect them. That's what DDI-CDI does. And it uses a lot of other standards to help it do that. But ultimately, it is the description of this chain so that you can understand the data structures, identify the datums, and understand how they played into the processes and were used in processes to produce other data sets that might have different structures. Um, they might reuse the datums. They might be, be the result of new datums coming into existence based on a processing of the old. And that's the scope of DDI-CDI. So I hope that gives you some idea what we're trying to do. It's, it's not a small task. Um, that's kind of my last slide. So I'm gonna turn now over to Hilda to talk to you more about, um, about really examples of the spec so you can, can get a, a slightly better idea of how it does the things I've just been talking about. Over to you, Hilda. Okay, let me uh, share my screen. <clears throat> yeah, here we are. Uh, in this path, I'm going to show some example constructs from the model and try to illustrate the example how it can be used. So what I'll talk about is just kind of examples. It's not about everything, but uh, I want to go a little into the details in the examples so to get a better understanding about the basis, the uh, basis uh, examples it can be used for. I'll show some uh, examples from the model as well but they will not be explained in detail. The main message here is basically the ability that Arafan explained to distinguish between the structures and the content that is new in DDI-CDI. Uh, first of all, we have something called uh, foundational metadata. That is metadata reused many of the places in the model. They can kind of form the basis uh, uh, conceptual components of the model. We have the concept and concept systems. Concept systems can be uh, either very simple structured like, like just a list or they can be complex structures, how the different concepts relate to each other. We can have variables, many types of them, and they are also so uh, kind of concepts, I'll show a bit more about that later on. It's variables that will be mostly described here. And then we have also related conceptually based um, classes like classification code list, categories, etc. That is useful in classification management and yeah, all over the model, these things are used. We also have a regarding uh, populations, units, and universes, where the unit types are the most generic. Uh, universes is a kind of specialization, a population is a specialization of that again. Uh, what is in GSIM, but what was more 
developed and included also in the DDI, CDI with the DDI4 development is the variable cascade. That is also kind of reused in um, the DDI lifecycle from 3 to 2 on. And uh, that is kind of about variable. It can be, you don't have only one variable. Variables can do many different things. And uh, in the DDI CDI, we have three levels of variables. That is the conceptual variables, that is the most generic level, and the rep represented variables, that is about the representation of those, and then the instance variables that are about the collected data. And here you can see uh, an extract from the model, a snippet from the model regarding that. We see the conceptual variable on the top that inherits from concept we see here. And uh, if that is uh, used very generically, that is very reusable and also uh, searchable. But it depends what you enter there, how you use it, how, how reusable it is. Then we have the representation here, represented variable and the instant that have uh, the physical data type, platform, etc. It could be a variable function if it is a weight and so on. And let's see here about the conceptual variable. We see here it kind of uses a concept, it inherits from, from a concept and it measures a unit type and that's what we uh, want to collect measures on, on the most high, highest level. We can say, for instance, we want to, to measure about people, and then uh, that could be further specialized in, in that structure. But the conceptual variable on the highest level, that is uh, related to the unit type. We can also see here uh, at the bottom of the page that the conceptual variable can take um, kind of uh, concepts for what it expresses, the characteristics, but there are no values involved in this in uh, this level, and you don't need to have it. But it could make sense, for instance, to to already specify the concepts that you you are, is included in in that measurement you want to have, and also what is called sentinel conceptual. Uh, uh, domain is about more like what you don't want to have in your anal analysis, like the missing concepts, don't know, refusal, and so on. That is possibly uh, possible at this level. Not always would it make sense, but uh, sometimes, and then you could use it. Then you have the represented variable, and there you can add uh, a kind of substantive value domain with codes, if it is a code list, and so on. But it's still very reusable. Maybe uh, many of you who worked with data, you know that uh, you have a kind of a code list and, and it can be kind of reused in, in uh, many different instances. And, and uh, the represented variable kind of references that. So that is about what Arifan said, reused. That is what, what this can do. And it is very useful indeed. And then you, again, you have, have the, the instance variable had. This is very useful for search also. You can, you can kind of search at the different levels for things. You can, uh, it is useful for harmonization. And we'll get back to that with using an example. And then again, instance variable describing the collected data, physical data type and platform, the role as we described. And what is here that it inherited, it inherits also uh, features from the others. That is also, or it can kind of reference the content of higher, uh, uh, variables higher up in the hierarchy. Here, let's take an example, which is a practical example from the European Social Survey. We see here uh, on the top, we have the conceptual variable, 
which is legal marital status. We have the, the represented level, two variables. And at the instance variable level, we have three variables. Um, this uh, legal marital status is kind of affecting how people, <laughs> uh, yeah, how, how well people feel and their lives. And therefore the ESS wanted to measure le legal marital status. And they started up with the represented variable, very basic, uh, married, separated, divorced, widowed, and never married. That was in 2004. But then it turned out that compared to official statistics, that proved really badly. And uh, lots of things were done to change the measurement and so on. That is not reflected on, on uh, the, the level of the variables, but um, the categorization is reflected there and it was changed. And that you can see here on the right side. Then first uh, the term legally is added to the different categories or most of them. And also um, the civil unions needed to be accounted for at all levels. So, um, and you can also see that the codes changed here. Uh, divorce was free before and uh, now it is more like four and you include the civil union there. So uh, what you can basically use this for is to see what is comparable and what is not. You see here for this simple example, it is one survey and several rounds. You can see that two of um, the instance variables references uh, one um, represented variable at that both instances of the represented variable references the conceptual variable. And this way, it is easy to see how this compares. But you can have more difficult cases than that. You can have uh, two variables in different data sets that measure the same co concept, but in a different way. Uh, it could measure the same concept in the same way, but be represented differently physically. Or it can exist identically in two data sets, but there is no formal link between them. So you don't know that. But in all these cases, if you understand the variables at each level, then you have a strong basis to be able to programmatically identify them as potential points for joining data sets. Uh, DDI, CDI uh, uh, can also um, kind of harbor external control vocabularies, ontologies or tesoro. But uh, that is by um, the use of the concept system. It doesn't model the semantics itself, but it, it has room or structure to kind of take them in. It has a rich model for classification code list and controlled vocabularies and a mechanism for references, external uh, ontologies and vocabularies. And what is also in the DDI CDI is that the formal use of concept is specified. That can be variable categories, population units, etc., as we were talking about. Uh, the systems are modeled generically, but they can be external. So this today, uh, many of the different domains develop their own ontologies, and they can be used together with DDI CDI. But the DDI CDI doesn't provide the semantic mapping, but framework where it can be included and can uh, make sense. So CDI is a kind of structure with these kind of ontologies and tesoros and mappings from 
external vocabularies can live. Yeah, so uh, before I, I go into data structures, I wanted to ask first um, Arafan, uh, would you, do you have anything to add on what I just was talking about? No, I think that that's quite good, Hilda. Um, there's obviously a lot to this part of the model around foundational metadata. So um, what we're giving you is some hints at the kind of things that, that are there. Um, people would want to go and look in more detail at the specification if they, if they are serious about this. Um, it gets quite uh, tech, technical and quite theoretical, um, but people shouldn't be put off by that. I think a lot of the goodness of, of CDI really comes straight from the DDI4 model. I think it's important to emphasize that. And it's very much a continuation of what we had in DDI lifecycle and before that code book. Um, if people don't have any questions at this point, um, should we take a, a quick break, Hilda, before we go on? How, how are... Yes, I think that's fine that we take uh, like five minutes break now and go back. But please, uh, if you have some questions or, or comments or want to see one of the slides once again or whatever, you can just let us know now. Otherwise, we take a five minutes break and uh, go back and talk about data structures, right? Okay, so at 10 off, everyone should, should return. Very good. Okay. See you. Okay, uh, it's time to now, and then I start to describe data structures. 
what is new with DDI CDI is that it can describe data from many different structures. Uh, the wide data as a traditional unit record data file, uh, long data that can be used for event or stream data, a key value as in a key value store, or dimensional as with aggregate data. And uh, now I'm going to show some examples of data use. And the way I do it is that I present the examples first and then go a little but not in depth into the model and how everything works. So uh, I start here with an example that is developed by our colleague Larry Hoyle from the University of, of Kansas. And that is related to COVID related information at building doors. There's a picture of some of the instruments you can use. There's a questionnaire here. And uh, Larry is using Python. And uh, he, the case here is that Python collects COVID related information at building doors about blood pressure, systolic and diastolic. Um, the position when taking the blood pressure, if you are sitting prone or standing, the weight of the person, the temperature of the person, uh, percent uh, O2, uh, pulse, if they have been to Florida or another area with, with much COVID, that was the time this example were, uh, was, um, uh, developed or if they have been exposed. So quite a lot of information and now we'll see some ways of structuring this. First we could take a, a spreadsheet table like a normal rectangular data file. We see we have the ID here to the, uh, the right the entry uh, that kind of identifies the whole row. We have uh, the time it was collected and we see also all the different variables that were, were, were captured by the program. We see that some of them are numeric, some of them are uh, integer, some decimal, some are a kind of text, alphanumeric and so on. Uh, we can also see the same structure as tab delimited text lines that is below. So uh, in DDI CDI, you could have then uh, the entry is the identifier, you have lots of measure, but maybe the position is different. The position is about the measures because it it is about how you <laughs> were yeah, your position, they had when they took all these measures. So that is kind of more uh, an attribute of the measure than a measure in, in itself. Then you can see again, you have the same content, as I said, but it is now transformed into a long structure. And what happens now in the long structure you see for each entry, you have many different rows and uh, the daytime also the, this was collected. Then you have a column here with, with all the measures, what they were. And uh, uh, that is in DDI CDI called uh, variable descriptor component. You see all the different variables here, systolic, diastolic, weight, temperature, and so on. And then, uh, for, uh, for each of those entries, you have the position they had and you have the value. And uh, the value in, in this one need to be very generic because you see you have, you have here a decimal, you have integer, you have also text. So, so uh, uh, the variable of this is, has to have a, a generic format. So you see again, um, this, uh, the same content, different structure, and DDI-CDI is able to capture this. 
Now we have a different example. Uh, around where I live, there is lots of fisheries, so therefore it is interesting to to have an example of that, and I hope that will be a little interesting for you as well. Um, the, the boats are out fishing and data for each landing of catches are coded. Then that is when boats come ashore and deliver the catch. And uh, those fishery statistics include a lot of, a, a lot of measures. And uh, for instance, what boat it is, the nationality, the equipment used, the species, a round rating ton, which is the measure we will focus on, on. Landing time, that was when the catch was delivered, and lots and lots of other information. And here we have uh, an ex a long, long example uh, from fisheries statistics in Norway. You can see the species, and here you have uh, pictures of them, the different that is described here. Uh, I use only one one uh, one measure here, uh, and that is round weighting ton. I think fishing equipment here can be an attribute to that measure, and then we have a combined kind of identifier consisting in the boat name, uh, the landing date, and and the species that was in that catch, uh, in that uh, in that um, landing. So uh, we see here that uh, the boat landing in that uh, uh, it delivered uh, landed in Bømlo, uh, that is an island south of Bergen. It landed a catch on 7th April uh, 2019 with the blue whiting. You see what it is here. Around right in ton and the fishing equipment was troll. Then uh, there was Legrun. Uh, she had in uh, in uh, the landing date of 29 August uh, uh, 2019, both herring and pollock with different weights, and that was also tall. And but on the 25th um, uh, of uh, September, she had mackerel, and that was caught in a sand net, also, and so on. So that is that structure. But this was a long example. This is a much shorter example. Fish catching boats. So <laughs> that is that's a much shorter example. <laughs> um, back again to uh, the more serious one. Now we want to aggregate this. We want to put this into aggregates for statistical purposes. The year 2019 Norwegian boats around right in ton is the measure. And we see here that from our long table from the former, uh, some former slide is now aggregated into this group. The group is, has kind of two dimensions and uh, the data are identified by those dimensions in DDI, CDI also. And we can see here for where the different go, that the herring and the mackerel go to the pelagic fish, and uh, in which which kind of uh, data point they belong to depends on on uh, on how they were who were caught. So and then uh, we have uh, an example of streaming data, barometric pressure. Maybe you don't know what that is, but sometimes or almost every day for us that are not meteorologists, um, we uh, hear about that on the weather forecast every day. So when there is sun and warm air, then it's a, a high and um, cold air, then it, it's low. And uh, this example is about uh, streaming data. And that is uh, data that can uh, arrive at predict unpredictable times and is a flexible set of data. And uh, the example we should look at is uh, an example from the sensor observation from the W3C semantic sensor network ontology. Um, and uh, it is of a barometric pressure me measured in hectopascal taken by an iPhone. And, uh, what it is in words, 
uh, pressure is it, it is caused by the weight of the air above us. Uh, we have here a key value example that is expressed uh, in in the bottom here. We uh, on the top we have a wide example uh, with the sensor ID with the property. Uh, the measurement, atmospheric pressure in hectopascal, the time and the resulting value. But in the key value, then the sensor ID and the property are concatenated, and then you have have uh, that the resulting value that is kind of attached to that that uh, that key. And uh, uh, what Arafan was talking about is the datum approach. Uh, the datum kind of link everything together. And we have metadata very close up on the observation. We saw from just from the examples that uh, uh, content can be expressed in different structures and DDI CDI is able to handle this. First, here we can see a little about, about how things is done there. I'll go into the structures a little more later, but uh, we see here that we have a data point that is a kind of cell in, in one of the structures. It can be also a kind of storage cell, whatever it is for, for the content of, of uh, of the value that is called a data point. And in that data point, there is an instance value. That is the value that you see, the representation of what is measured. And at the bottom of the page, uh, page you can see an example of such a value, 114. That is what you see. That value could be expressed in different ways, but the meaning would be the same. The meaning that is the re reusable thing about the value is the conceptual value that inherits from the concept. So that is, is basically a kind of common thing for all those different representations that instance value can take. Datum is what binds the instance value and the conceptual value together. And that is bounded together in an instance variable that also describes the data point. So that is, that is basically, uh, that is basically uh, the datum approach. And at the level of the data point, you could also, you see it says annotated identifiable there. That means you, that you can attach kind of uh, information related to uh, search and uh, citation and also even all that kind of stuff, even at the level of the data point. You see also to the left on the bottom, there is something inheriting from instance value that is called a value, value string. That is to be able to, to kind of link up like pictures and other, other material, but it, they cannot be described yet in, in DDI CDI, but it is the kind of first step towards being able later on to be able to describe qualitative data. Then again, uh, a bit more practical about those structures I was talking about. We can see here, uh, we have uh, here, if we look at the brown boxes, we have three different representations of the same value. They are, di they are written differently and they are different instance values but they all refer to the same conceptual value tied together 
by the by by that. And keys can be used to map the transformation between the structures and uh, at the same time link them together. So uh, an important aspect of the model, this is again a bit abstract, but I thought just I should mention it. That is the concept of the key. And uh, the CDI uses key to put data points into a specific structure. And keys are a collection of data instances that are the members. And as you see here, they inherit from the instance variable. And the instance, no, from the instance value, I mean. And the instance values are stored with the data point. I think Arafan mentioned that data point can take different roles. And uh, for all of, I have just show one example from the long structure here. But uh, for all of the structures, they have, have kind of uh, model snippets also that show this, how it works for, for the different one, different structures. But we see here the, the data point and the key here. And we see the so-called to the right, the data structure components. That is basically kind of roles that the data point can take. It can be a, an identifier. It can be a measure. It can be an attribute. And uh, also we, we discussed described a little that we had this long structures where you had this kind of uh, variables with, with all of those different variables included, you remember? And they are referring to the values or the reference values on, on those variables. So, so that is also some, some uh, value uh, data point can take in a long structure. That is a, as a descriptor. For instance, um, had this example again with the, with the COVID, um, the systolic, and that had a reference value. You had diastolic, that is a different, and that, that had again a, a different instance reference value. So uh, that is special for long. While these identifier, measure, and attribute, they are for all the different structures. And here you, we can see again this in, in, in the form of the data set. We have the identifiers like entry and date time. We have position, attribute component, as we talked about that a little already. The variable descriptor com component, like we said, uh, systolic dia diastolic could be descriptors, and then the variable value compo component. So um, that is kind of how it will, looks like a data set and relating to how it is in the model. And here we can see uh, it's simpler in the wide. Then you have a unit entry. Here is unit identifier. And uh, you have lots of measure components, but then again, the attribute component in the position. So that is how that would look. And this is important for automating data integration because the rules don't need to be the same within the same structure, but within different structures, I mean, they can change but when you know the role a variable play in the data set, then you can predict what it will be in the new structure that, that you are transforming it into. 
and the models show how this relates and uh, you can avoid manual intervention uh, and reduce up to 80% resource burden on project for preparing data for analysis. Then now uh, at the end here, we could have one example about power data as attributes in DDI CDI. That is quite interesting because uh, when you look at the long structure to the right up here, you can see that the attributes don't apply to all of the measures necessarily. Your weight doesn't change if you lay or sit or, well, hopefully, and also your temperature, but your pulse may change or and your, your blood pressure may change depending on your position, if you lie down or if you stand or if you sit or whatever. So you see here for weight and temperature, the cells are empty. Um, but in, in uh, the white data format, you cannot do that. You, the position will, uh, will apply to everything here. But what you could do in the DDI CDI is that you could create a variable collection. And the variable collection can have many different structures. And um, here we make one, for instance, we say that position influences systolic, pulse and diastolic, but not weight, for instance. And that can be useful information to have along with it. So then you can interpret your data on, on the basis of that. So that is basically uh, what I had. Um, Arafan, do you have some? Um, oh, I, I just additions? just two, two, two points. One of our slides reformatted Hilda badly, so that the the tabs showed up wrong. If anybody noticed that, it was the one with the brown boxes. Um, oh, it looked like like your weight was actually the temperature, and that could be um, makes you either very thin or or, or very very warm. Um, oh. But, but um, people may have noticed that. Um, the other thing is that the 80% figure you quoted, I, we should put that in context because it, it shouldn't be misunderstood. Um, there was a report that, that the European Commission had Pricewaterhouse Coopers do about the cost of not having fair data in Europe. And they estimated that up to 80% of the recess resource burden on a lot of projects that were using data from other domains was spent not analyzing the data, but getting the data to the point where it could be analyzed up to 80%, which is a, an alarming figure when you think about it. Um, so that the point of automating data integration is cutting down that number because the less resources that go into doing manual preparation of data, uh, you know, the more resource you have to actually do the analysis and to do research. And that's sort of the point of that figure. I just wanted to put that in a little bit of context, Hilda. Um, I guess, do we ha have any questions at this point? Because I feel like we've talked a lot and some of this is pretty confusing stuff and we're about to make people even more confused. Do we have anything in the question list? No, they all understand everything. These people are smart. Um, so I guess we go on to the exercise, is that right? Should we give people a chance to ask questions? Um, yeah, people can ask questions, but otherwise we can go on with the exercises. Okay. I should explain about the exercises while we're waiting for people to type up questions, which is that um, normally this workshop would be face-to-face -face somewhere um, in Europe and would not involve um, so many people because you can only have so many people in a face-to-face -face workshop. But since we're virtual, um, we can't do the normal exercises that we would do hands-on. And so we've tried to come up with a way of doing that. And we're going to a little bit use you as guinea pigs because this is the first time we've tried to use these. So bear with us, be forgiving. Um, but we tried to come up with something online that would, would allow you to, to, to play around with the sort of things we've been talking about. And um. If you look, can can you screen share that link or put it in the chat or something, um, Hilda? Maybe it is still yes. in the chat. 
I can put it in the chat just a second. Because if people want to go to that link, I'm I'll pull it up and I'll, I'll share my screen. Let me make sure I've got this here. Um, okay. And I show oh, people. We're encouraging you to 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 to, to, to um, Okay. And I want which one? Well, I'll just say screen. And then, um, so I'm going to go. Can you guys see my screen now? Is that visible, Hilda? Yes. Can you put it in the chat? So Hilda's been talking about data points and about the roles they play in different structures. And she showed you the, the ones we use for this workshop are really the wide and the long format and um, didn't get so much into big data, didn't get so much into the multidimensional. But um, this is a really, really critical concept in understanding how DDI CDI describes data because different data points can play different roles and often they play the same role, but sometimes they don't. And those differences are the difference between having to go in and fix something manually or being able to automate it. And so this is sort of building on the last slide that Hilda showed you. Here's the scenario. We've taken a survey, a very, very small sample, two people. So presumably there would be more people and this would be done over across time. What they're studying is education and income, which is a pretty normal thing to study. And they're looking at differences in terms of age and sex. And um, they would be, uh, maybe it's a panel survey where they would be surveying the same people over and over and over as they got older and made more or less money over time. But the, the members of our sample that we've looked at are two. There's a guy named Robert Murphy. He's 25 years old. He's, he's a male and he graduated from university and he's making 12,000 euros a year. So he may not be the most successful college graduate ever, but he's graduated college. Um, and then there's a 12 year old girl named Antonio Esperanza. And she has a really, really cool YouTube channel. I'm not sure what's on it. And these are fictitious, of course, but she's making a quarter of a million euros a year. Um, and she hasn't graduated school yet. She's still at 12 years old, right? Um, so she has no university degree, but I'm not even sure she's gonna bother getting one at that rate. Um, mm -hmm. If you're banking a quarter million a year, you can pretty well retire early. Um, this data is um, validated um, before it's accepted in, in the, for research. So this might be like an official statistics thing where they validate and then give it st an okay stamp and then they can publish it, or it might be some other process in a data production. Um, thing about this data is that it can be formatted as wide data or as long data. So what we've done here is we've taken that, those tables, we would ordinarily make you mark this up with a, we would give you a, a printed sheet of paper and make you mark up the two different formattings of this data table. Instead, what we've given you is this sort of palette of colored blocks over here. And you can see that these are the roles played by data points. They might be variables, instance variables, really. Um, they might be identifiers. They might be unit identifiers. That's a distinction Hilda didn't talk about, but it's an important one, is that sometimes you have um, identifiers that specifically identify a unit, and sometimes they're part of an identifier for that data structure. And that's important to know. We have variable values, obviously cell values. We have attributes. And then we have these variable descriptors that Hilda was talking about. And your job is to go and grab these blocks and drop them on the variables. So I say, okay, age is a variable. I drag it over here, I drop it, boom, it goes. If you drop it directly on top of the words, it might flip back. If you try to do something illegal, like call name a variable descriptor, it just won't drop, right? It just won't go. And so your job is to code at least the first two rows in each of these examples with the roles played by each, each cell in the table. Um, some cells will take more than one role because they are more than one thing. Some cells will not. Um, and they only take one. Every cell will take at least one. And so what we're going to do is ask you to, to log onto this in a browser and start dragging and dropping boxes onto things. And when you're done, then I'll show you um, what the correct answer is. So I, how long is this going to take, do you think, Hilda? Should we give them a, a, 
10 minutes or five minutes? Yeah, we can uh, maybe uh, five minutes and then we can, uh, when you can, uh, you can go through it and then we have a question also after that. So maybe five minutes, do you think that's enough? Yourself? I think so. So people, the, the job is to drag the right boxes onto the right things over in the table in the first two rows in each of these examples, okay? You don't have to use all the boxes and, um, and some, some cells will take more than one box, okay? And um, if, you, if you, when in doubt, read the text or put a question in the chat and we'll, and we'll get back to you. All right, people, five minutes.
Okay. I think that's probably, I, I'm guessing people have had enough time. I have no sense of that. No one's saying anything, so we don't know. But um, I hope people had fun dragging and dropping little boxes. It's a silly kind of, kind of um, exercise. But I, I'm going to walk through this and show you what, what is happening here, what we thought was the right answer anyway. So when you look at the, at the wide table here, it's pretty clear that the entire top row is a set of variables, right, potentially. All of these can be, can be seen as variables and described using variables. Um, and so that would be right. Oh, no, it wouldn't, because validated isn't a variable. It's an attribute, right? Whether or not this set of entries has been validated is, is paradata. It's not actually a measurement about the unit. That's the distinction between a variable and an attribute. Some of these things are more than just variables, though. If I look at the name, Murphy Robert is actually identifying something. So that's an identifier, and that it likes that. But Robert Murphy is also the unit, because my, my unit type is, is persons. Oh, I'm not allowed to put the boxes on top of each other. But if I put it there, you can see. So the name column is actually all three of those things. Below that, they're just variable values. And so you can see that um, this is, gets a little repetitive. Well, you only really have to do the first two rows to get it because the second row, the third row will be the same as the second one. Um, and there aren't any variable descriptors in this table at all because it's a wide table. So you understand we have an identifier that refers to a unit and in unit record data, that identifier uniquely identifies the record. It's all you need. You have a series of variables that make up the record and you might have attributes about those variables. The, the, the data points in the cells are just the values of those variables. An instance value is the, what the model calls them. Now, when we look at the long format, things get a little more complicated. It's the same data. So some of these things are gonna be the same. The measure is a variable. Come on, oh no, it's not. What is measure? Because value is a variable, but what is measure? And this is where we get into that variable descriptor thing. It's not actually a variable. It's a variable descriptor. And what it does is it contains references to variables. Does that make sense? What were, what were column headings in my wide format become values in this column. Now I have name and date. Are these things variables? They are. But are they anything else? Name, I think we already identified, could be a unit identifier, which means it's an identifier. What about date? How do I tell the difference between Murphy Robert 2020 and Murphy Robert 2020? For each of my measures, I need to be able to identify the unit completely, which means that the date is also functioning as an identifier. And this is a distinction. Probably people may easily have missed that because that is, is one of the tricky things about it. You have to look at how you do identifiers and the unit identifier, any other identifying variables that are in the key that Hilda talked about, and that would include the variable descriptor, uniquely identify each of these values. Again, whether something's been validated or not is paradata. And all of these things just become variable values essentially. Right. Um, so I think that explains what we were trying to show in this exercise. Um, someone asked a question in the chat about, is there a value to just describing this kind of rectangular table using DDI CDI? And that's a complicated answer because if all you're gonna do is describe rectangular tables inside your institution, you probably don't need DDI CDI to do that for your own internal use. That's what DDI Codebook and DDI Lifecycle are for. However, DDI CDI with a little bit of information about the roles being played could be programmatically produced from DDI Codebook or DDI Lifecycle. And the value of that is if somebody else wants to use your rectangular data in a different form, 
say, as long data, that if you understood these roles here, you could easily produce this because you understand which variables play a different role here so that your date field becomes part of your identifier. It's not in your rectangular file. You can see that your variable descriptor is a, is a new thing composed of a list of the variables here, of your, me of your measures. And um, those kinds of, of changes can be made programmatically by in reference to the DDI CDI model. So the value of describing a rectangular table this way is so that other people can take it and automatically turn it into what they need to do their own work with it. And that may or may not be important to your institution. So it's not that DDI CDI is of huge value to everybody, but what it does do is it makes your data more fair. And that's the point. Um, I think that is really the point of this exercise. Did we get any, is anybody freaking out? Is anyone angry or confused? Probably. Um, so we're happy to take feedback on this. I, we weren't quite sure how to do a hands-on example online, so that's what we did. And I, I, I hope that was useful. Um, what we're gonna do now is, is carry on. Um, we've talked about all of these. Hmm, that's a very, very slow way to get there. But um, we've been through all the data structures and examples. There's the fisheries. You should be aware, by the way, that um, Pollock is a, cod, a type of cod. Um, and Hilda didn't explain that, but if you really like fish, you know that anyway. So this is where Hilda ended up and we did the exercise. I wanna switch gears now a little bit and talk about the process model because the other big feature of DDI-CDI is the ability to describe how datums playing roles in one format can inform additional uh, datums in subsequent formats and what the transformation is potentially between those things. Um, so here's the, the simple, oops, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about what we cover in this model. For actually describing individual processing, so functions, um, we're still relying on things like do files and Stata or SPSS or Python, SAS, whatever your language of choice is, or standard descriptions of those in things like SDTL or VTL, if you, if you are familiar with that standard, more used for validation in the, in the aggregate data world. Um, and so the process model is not really describing though that level of processing. What it's describing are the connections between those processes. And the thing is, when you start looking at processing engines in the modern world, you realize that there are th really three different kinds. We're very familiar with what, what are called procedural processes. So stepwise processes, um, which have de uh, decision points and sub-steps and flow. And I'll show you an example. But a newer thing is what are termed declarative processes, where you have a sort of black box. And these tend to be multi-threaded and they can be incredibly powerful. But really, you, they do a completely different thing. You sort of feed the process engine a set of criteria and you give it a set of functions and you give it some data and metadata and then it does its thing. And at the end, you have your product. And for, for very complex um, processing, that can be incredibly valuable. Um, it's pretty new technology. You can also have approaches, and this is typical, that are a hybrid of the two, where you do some things procedurally, and then you invoke these black box functions at the places where you need them. And so for DDI-CDI, we had to try to describe all three, uh, all three of these cases, um, really two, because the hybrid is just the other two combined. Um, hello, now my, there we go. So here's the simple diagram. I'm not gonna start off with the model because that's a bit complicated. On the left-hand side, we have these activities, which are what they're, they're called in, um, in DDI-CDI, which are the major things you're trying to do at a business level. So that's your overall process. And your activity in a procedural process is made up of, set, of steps, which have sub-steps. And all the steps and sub-steps can have inputs and outputs. 
and the output of one step might be an input to the next step. And all of the, the way those things work together is managed by your control logic. Um, for, your, for your declarative processing, you sort of have this process engine, the black box, and you feed it parameters, your criteria, when, when are you done processing? Um, and you feed it a, a playbook, what they call a playbook, which is a series of functions or templates that it can apply in different situations. And then according to its internal logic, it applies those functions as it sees appropriate um, to operate on the inputs and produce the outputs. And so that's a, really a kind of a different way of interacting with the, with the process engine. But again, there is a control logic to it. And the control logic, as you can see, is shared so that in a hybrid process, I can pass things between the, the declarative and procedural processes however I need. And the control logic is what determines what that is. Let me break this down a little bit further for you. Um, I'm gonna give you an example. It's a very sort of trivial example. Let's say that I have some data I wanna clean and um, I, I wanna identify, I wanna inspect my data. So I wanna identify where I have impossible or improbable cases. So if I have three-year-olds giving birth or people getting married to themselves or people giving birth to themselves, those things can't actually happen. And so if my data has cases where that's going on, I want it to be flagged so I can get rid of it, right? I might have some improbable cases that I want to validate. Like I might have 12 year olds that are earning 250 euro, 250,000 euros a year, which is possible, but just not very likely. Um, so they might be okay, but I wanna check them out. So I, I have these kinds of cases that I wanna ins I want to inspect my data and identify them. Um, and then based on the overall numbers of impossible and improbable cases, I'm gonna evaluate the quality. And I might continue with my processing and clean the data and then go on and use it. Or I might just error out. I might say, nope, this data is garbage. I've got to go back and fix the data collection. And then I'll come back and try this again. Um, and so my third step would be to produce the clean data set. And, but I will have trimmed out or otherwise resolved my impossible and improbable cases. So this is like a, a kind of mini use case, a, kind of a, a trivial, silly case. But it's a, I think you get the idea. As a procedural process, it would look like this. I have my inspect data step. That's the first step. So it takes some input data and the cor corresponding metadata, and it looks at it and it produces an, a report of the errors. How many improbable, how many impossible cases. And that report becomes an input to my evaluate data step. And the evaluate data step is a decision point. If it accepts the, the number of errors, it invokes the produce clean data step. If it rejects it, I just stop. So assuming that there aren't too many errors in my data, I'll go through and I'll clean it and I'll get cleaned data and maybe hopefully some cleaned metadata out the backside. And all of these steps, that flow and the decision point would be managed by a control process, which would be, be in this case, flow logic, okay? Um, in a procedural, I mean, in a declarative process, this is gonna look a little different. I give it my input data and metadata, and then I give it parameters, completion criteria. I say, when you have less than X number of impossible cases and less than X number of um, improbable cases, um, then you have cleaned data. And there would be different kinds of functions for dealing with the different situations it might encounter. And that would all be in my playbook. And I would feed it those things, hit the start button, and it would produce clean data and clean metadata, or it wouldn't. It would just say, no, this is garbage. I can't deal with it and stop. Um, and the process control would be the thing that invokes it and then tells me when it's done, basically. There's not a lot of flow in this because what goes on inside that black box can be very, very complicated. These things tend to be multi-threaded, which better allows them to leverage the, the power of modern computers. However, <clears throat> these are not simple flows and they're not easily understandable in a step-by-step -step narrative. Um, you might be able to do this simple example as a step-by-step -step narrative easily enough, but um, that's not how we describe them in DDI-CDI because typically what goes on in that black box is just too complicated. Um, when you look at the process model that we have here, 
I think you'll immediately see what's, why that is the case. Now, the model does not lay things out as clearly, I think, as my, as my boxes and arrows did. You can, if you start with the activity towards the, the left-hand side here, you'll see that it can produce and use information objects, which might be metadata, might be um, data, whatever it is in combination. And I can have steps that have parameters, which might be my in, information flow definition coming from my control logic. And there is a, a control logic to the activity. That control logic might be deterministic, that is procedural, where I have a sequence and I have flow. It might be declarative, non-deterministic, which can deal with things like rule-based scheduling, temporal constraints, which can be described with an Allen's interval algebra, if you're familiar with that. Um, there could be different kinds of temporal control constructs. This stuff gets very, very complicated. And so you can see that your control logic is taking different kinds of inputs and executing steps or producing outputs. And you can describe it using this model um, in the ways that I sort of characterized it earlier in the slides. I'd like to, to point out something else in this, in this model though. If you look at the gray boxes along the top, you'll see references to PROV, which is a W3C ontology for describing provenance. Now, PROV is an interesting standard because it's not meant to be used directly. It is always meant to be um, refined and implemented for specific purposes. And so what we've done is implemented PROV to describe our information objects, which are PROV entities. Our activities are PROV activities. We use them directly. Um, we have a thing called a processing agent in DDI-CDI, which is a, a kind of a prov, a PROV-O agent. And as you move further right, you see PROV-1. What is PROV-1? Well, PROV-1 is Data-1's implementation of PROV-O. And we found some things for working with data that they had already modeled. And we decided that rather than remodel them, we were just going to take their implementation of PROV. Um, so you, they have things like programs and workflows in PROV-1 that don't exist natively in the W3C spec. And, but some people are using that stuff. And so we wanted to um, reuse what they had done already. And if you are familiar with UML, you'll see these are trace relationships, which is a very specific kind of relationship in UML that basically says we're using one of those things from an external uh, model. And so we're just pulling these things in and using them as much as we can. Other people who have systems that work with PROV will be able to work with CDI because of this. The mapping is very clear. Um, if you're interested in this topic, I would just mention that there are a couple of things coming up that you might want to see. There is, I think it's on Wednesday, a presentation that George Alter from, from University of Michigan has organized um, with some help from myself regarding provenance in general across a bunch of different standards that we've talked about here. And that's going to be part of the International Fair Convergence Symposium. It's a free event. Um, and if you, you go fair and co-data are co-organizing co it. Um, but there's a there's a provenance session there on Wednesday. And then on the following Wednesday, December 9, um, the people in the DDI CDI um, group, the MRT, who were mostly responsible for the provenance model will be doing a webinar and explaining this in more detail. Um, and that would be Flavio uh, Rizzolo and Jay Greenfield. And they're gonna be doing a webinar at um, 10 a.m. Eastern. I don't know what that is, your time. I think um, an hour later than this workshop started. Um, and that will be on Wednesday the 9th, also a free activity. You can register at, at the CoData site for that. Um, I wanna show you what this stuff is good for because provenance means a lot of things to a lot of people. And I'm going to show you some design screens from a project that we're currently doing, in fact, using the DDI-CDI provenance model and also the structural descriptions. The question that researchers often ask is, what is this number really? Where did this come from? How was this number produced? And um, very often the answers to that question are very unsatisfying or there simply isn't an answer. You just don't know. Well, that was the number in the data set. And they said that was a good measurement, so it must be a good measurement. And that's not good enough for some researchers. And they'd always like to know more, I think. Um, 
So I'm going to show you an example of how we decided to try to approach that. I mentioned earlier the Inspire Project Alpha, um, uh, which is which is looking at HIV data in Africa, and the creation of a harmonized data set that's that's published to to describe the whole region of southern and eastern Africa, and um, the the input numbers are changed as they're harmonized, and so the researchers wanted to know what happened. So I'm going to show you an application we're building to give those researchers visibility into what their data is. It's called a provenance browser. And so um, we're looking at metadata around the provenance, which is programmatically mined from the ETL platform. It's a thing called Pentaho that basically takes the input data and pulls it out of each of the data contributors databases and then does some pre-processing on it and turns it over to another Pentaho inst instance running in London that performs the rest of the harmonization um, and ultimately outputs the harmonized data set. Now, most of the processing is being done in Stata, which is the tool of choice in, in that domain. Um, and that's what they like to use in London. It's what they use at most of the sites. And I think it's just a matter of what they learned when they were in school. But the chaining of Stata scripts is described in DDI-CDI, and that DDI-CDI is mined automatically off of the execution platform, which is a, an open source package called Pentaho. Um, a lot of the people in this picture use DDI codebook to describe the input data. So we're mining the DDI codebook to, to gather information about the variables, the codes, categories, those kinds of things, um, wherever they exist. There's some additional metadata that gets injected by hand for them from the people who are who are executing these processes. So there are descriptions of the purposes for each step and so on that are added, but it's a pretty small part of the overall metadata, honestly. Um, and we're trying to reduce the burden of documenting the provenance of the data. And we try to bring it all together in a way that the researchers can use easily. Here's the layout of the browser. I have on the left-hand side an overall process an activity in DDI-CDI terms made up of steps and, and, and sub-steps. And the sub-steps are actually status scripts. So they call them jobs and tasks are the names that the, the data managers like to use. And then associated with that overall process is a list of data sets, inputs, outputs, metadata, whatever. We're just calling them data sets here. And so I have my inputs and I have a job and I have my outputs and I can look at it graphically like this. So. The overall job could be there. I click whatever I click on here will show up here, and then I see specifically which inputs and outputs it has. Now, I can also click on one of the data sets and look at what job created it and what job consumed it. So you can see I can easily step through my process from beginning to end, but just by clicking on the boxes or clicking on the things on the left-hand panel. So it's a simple idea. It's a browser that shows you either the job or the data set you're interested in. And there are a bunch of links like the overview, the purpose, the algorithm, stuff you could mine out of the code book. <clears throat> if I click on a task, I can actually get to the Stata do file that, that executed the task. I don't know if you read Stata, but, but you get the idea. This might be SDTL, it might be VTL, it might be any kind of code, but something that the researcher would understand if they want the gory details about how that particular part of that job was being executed. Um, so DDI-CDI is putting a frame around this stuff, basically. I can take a look at, um, this, this is an example from, from the alpha where they do data quality metrics um, as their job. So they're producing a thing called spec 6.1 um, and in their data pipeline. And so they, they take the, the, the ETL for raw input, which is what's pulling it out of the, the site databases. And you have the overview and purpose of the job then you have a series of steps, and these are my tasks. If I click on one of them, it shows me that job with the input data set and the output data sets. And I have a, all the data sets would be listed at the bottom here. But I can see the names of these things, what they are. They have their identifiers. If I click on the purpose or something for a job, it just shows me whatever the human readable documentation is. I might wanna look at a particular step and the concepts that are involved in the processing of that step. So any variable that is related to a concept 
that is involved in that step out of any of the input data sets would be listed here. And I could click on them and get a, get a quick definition out of the metadata. Um, so you can do interesting things with the, with the metadata you've got and make it easy for people to look at it where it's relevant. Um, I might want to have a, a, a view a data set structure. So I'm looking at um, a specific thing where I have a data set in the middle and I click on the data set structure and it just shows me the record structure with the data types. And that's a pretty bad example, but you get the idea. There's a lot of metadata that we have that can be pulled together with the provenance information to produce a really useful clickable resource for, for researchers. And it's way easier than flipping through a bunch of code books and digging through a big pile of Stata or SPSS files. It just is. Um, and that's, that's what we were after here. So I'm just showing you this to give you some idea of the kinds of things you could do. Um, we're getting to the point where we're, we're going to be stopping soon. I wanted to, to highlight something that I think is going to be important in the future. We talk about a, a world full of fair, shareable data. People are involved in things like the European Open Science Cloud and, and all of these different large-scale initiatives for sharing data and making data fair. Um, in a world where all of the data is fair, we're going to have problems we cannot even imagine today because there will be so much data and so much metadata that, that is required by that data, we, we will have all of the problems we have today on steroids. And that is the right problem to have, sure, but we're gonna have to deal with it. I, people probably noticed during COVID that some very, very reputable journals published some very garbage research, not because the research was bad, but because the data it was based on was garbage. And when they went back to find out where that data came from and what it was, it turned out it was frabjous. Apparently, somebody claimed it had come from these hospitals, but the hospital said, no, that's not our data. No one had an answer. It was embarrassing for the journals. Bad policy was based on it. It was a disaster. And that's the sort of thing we can expect. What it does do is it highlights the importance of reproducing findings and what people call machine replication. I don't know if that's a good term or not. And replication and reproduction of findings, reproducibility of findings are terms that get used in different ways in different domains. The point is this, if we want to be able to determine that data is good data, and if we wanna have transparency about that, we need to be able to access all of this information, all of the information about how to understand the data, all of the information about what produced the data and where it came from. And ideally, we would be able to reconduct an experiment to simulate what was done programmatically. Because in the world of fair data, if machines can't do it, it's gonna take a lot more people than we've got working on it now. Um, really, we want to be able to automate this kind of thing. We wanna be able to understand that data is good data and submit it to automated checks that can benefit from really good provenance information and good data description. And I think when you imagine that the world to come and you imagine a good world with a lot of shareable data, you'll understand the importance of this. Um, DDS-CDI is not intended only for that use, but we do have to build towards that. We do need better provenance information. We do need understandable structural descriptions of all of the different kinds of data, as well as the semantics and domains in order to get our, our heads around this. Um, and so that's, I'm, I'm sort of going to leave you on that, um, on that specific application, um, because I think DDI-CDI really is a forward-looking standard, and that's something that, that we're going to have to be thinking about more and more as, as time goes by. Um, I'm going to move now to the summary, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I'm going to talk a little bit about the status, and we're going to talk a little bit about how you can feedback and comment on the, on the specification. Um, we've had a lot of engagement from external domains and, and people within the DDI community, um, our, our usual reviewers, and I explained that we've done a bunch of webinars. We're not quite done doing the webinars yet. There is an EOSC project um, that is recommending the different ways in which DDI CDI could be used in the European Open Science Cloud. We're talking to the various clusters, talking to FAIRS FAIR and their, their um, sort of cat interoperability, cataloging metadata people, a couple of other groups. Um, I think I mentioned already the International Fair Convergence Symposium. And Hilda and I and Jane um, Fry are going to be doing a workshop at that event later this week. 
and there's a, a number of other presentations of DDI in different panels there if you're interested. Um, the program is online. Um, so we've had a lot of engagement from the world at large here, and we've got a lot of feedback. Our next task, once we've finished sort of compiling all the feedback, is to change the model and to, and to, to finalize the specification. And we're expecting a release date in the second quarter of 2021 now. We'd hoped for that to be much earlier, but um, we got slowed down a lot by COVID. The face-to-face the -face workshops we'd planned did not happen because of that. So um, we're, we're releasing a little bit late, but I think it's been worth it because it's given us a chance to better engage with a lot of reviewers. Now, that said, um, it's not too late to look at what we've done and comment on it. And we're open to any kind of comment. So Hilda, I'm gonna turn over to you to talk about the next few slides. I don't know, do you want, do you want me just to click through them as you go or how do you wanna do this? Uh, well, we have a question. Maybe we should take some questions before we, we finish. Okay. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. There's a, mes a message from Morgan Skrulls Nielsen. Good exercise. I think the variable plays a different role in wide format and dimensional data. This is relevant for NSOs, he said. Do you want me to try to answer that? Yeah, <laughs> or maybe it, um, more, it, it is more 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 a comment than a question. But but uh, what I can say before we, you answer it that uh, it has a, also a dimension component in in addition to attribute and measure. That, that is something. That's something we didn't get into, Mogens. And this is where we yeah. start having trouble with terminology because you're absolutely right. Um, and the, the, um, what you see is that what you might think of as a variable in a microdata set um, contributes to a value that functions as a dimension or a measure in an aggregate data set. And we do model that. We didn't cover that in this workshop. Um, we looked very, very hard at SDMX and at the data cube vocabulary, and they're basically the same model, the SDMX model. Um, so that I think you'll find that what we have in DDI CDI is extremely familiar to you. Um, we didn't get into that in this workshop, but we do support that. Um, you can still view those values as being related to concepts through variables if you want to. And aggregate data can be stored in ways that are traditionally treated as microdata, um, which is a really, really weird um, way of thinking about it. But as you go across implementations, you'll see that sometimes that's the case. Um, I would be open to a discussion about whether there is exactly how a variable definition fits into a, 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 a derived value that appears in an aggregate table. And I think that's a discussion that might be worth having. I know that GSIM touches on that a bit and we also looked at GSIM. So, um, I think it's a very good comment, Mogens. I'm not sure that we have a 100% satisfying answer. Take a look at what we have done and see if it, if it makes you um, confused or angry, and then let us know. I think that might be the best uh, way to, to, to deal with that. But I think it is a very good question. Um, Hilda, is that, I don't know. Yeah, what that was uh, the question. And uh, now Wolfgang also uh, uh, posed a question. You mentioned that DDI-C and DDI-L can connect easily into DDI-CDI. Can you explain this a bit more, how it works? Um, well, we went through the process and Larry, I think I, we had mentioned, did this work with the R libraries. He'd already done a, a, a complete mapping of DDI codebook against um, the prototype of DDI-4. And so we largely, based on that, we have actually published as part of the public review version, a mapping table between codebook and, and DDI-CDI where there's overlap. Now um, that gets a little tricky because there are sometimes different mappings based on the context of the elements in DDI codebook, but that's included in the mapping. Um, the mapping, uh, oddly enough, the mapping to DDI lifecycle is a much simpler one because they're also using the, the variable cascade now. So um, 
I think when you take a, a DDI lifecycle description of a data set and want to produce DDI CDI, it's much easier to see how that works. The, the relationships between things in DDI CDI are richer than they are in lifecycle. But many of the, of the actual objects and the elements are the same. Um, so even though the encoding might be a little different, the payload and the mapping is, is a, a more direct one. Um, so I, I think that the idea here is that if I were, say, using Codebook or Lifecycle, I would write a program that would mine my DDI CDI out of my existing metadata. And that might require injecting a little bit of intelligence about the roles played by different variables, configuration file or something. Um, we wanted to make this so that people who wanted to also publish DDI CDI alongside their, their existing DDI metadata could do that programmatically to the greatest extent possible so that the burden was low. Probably with DDI lifecycle, you could do it almost completely. Um, once you've done that, other domains that don't use Codebook or Lifecycle, but who did implement CDI, could take your data and use it. Um, now, that becomes important because it may be that what you really want to do is go in the other direction, which is take somebody else's data described in CDI, like from a sensor feed or a big data pool, and integrate that with your rectangular data, your unit record data. Um, again, if they're describing their data in CDI, you can understand the roles played by the data points and how those things would map into a data structure that you could use to base your integration on. You could identify the variables, you could do joins on, you could identify which values are belong in which columns, so to speak, even though that's not the way they structure their data at all. Um, so we see that relationship going in both directions and depending on whether you're using or, or producing and, 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 and publishing data to other domains, um, that, that could be the difference. And it may be that it's not a different domain. You're just working with a different data format inside of this domain. I think a lot of things like social media data and big data aren't domain specific at all. They're just out there and you have to deal with them. So DDI CDI gives you a way to onroad that stuff into a, a DDI world that is actually based on lifecycle or codebook. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, Wolfgang. I hope so. We can talk about this for a long time, you know. <laughs> Okay, so Wolfgang says says thanks, and Mogan says thanks. So so I guess um, we can we can go ahead, Hilda. Do you want me just to drive the slides here? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, because um, you explain where you can find the different things to look into the model and and the chapters of the specification. Okay. Yeah. So can you see can you see the this slide now? Yeah, sh shall I read it? <laughs> yeah, you read them. <laughs> yeah, as sort of fans uh, told, DDI CDI is under public review, and your feedback is appreciated. And uh, the link to our review page is shown there. I can also put it in the chat, so you got it. Voila. And um, yeah, at, uh, we look at the review page afterwards just briefly. Um, the introduction document is useful and uh, that includes a brief summary of everything and the link to that, you can see that here. Yeah, can you? And here is uh, the DDI CDI review page, just high level, and we, we see what we can do here. You can uh, download the specification. There is a download package, or you can access the package from an index page. I don't go into detail about what is in the package that you need to explore yourself, but there is the specification, the models, examples, and so on. And then to the right, there is a link to um, a comment page where you can add comments either by writing to us or you can 
you can also enter a JIRA issue if you detect something. And you can also view which issues have been fielded in JIRA about the specification from that page. So yeah. that is basically review page, yeah. It's worth mentioning, Hilda, that, 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 that there is field level clickable documentation for the XML schema and also for the model. And those things are big. So if you download the whole package, it's a pretty big package. Um, it might be easier for people to use those things online, um, but that's one of the reasons why you might do one or the other. But the, but the, the detailed documentation is quite extensive and it's, it's presented, I think, in a pretty usable way. Um, I think the, as a last comment, we really are interested in getting people's comments. If you do not feel like filing JIRA issues, I know some people are comfortable with that in the DDI community, but if you just want to rend us, write us emails, send us documents, ask questions, um, we, are, we are open to that. So we really, really want input from anybody who's taken the time to look at the specification and, and wants to, to share their comments and opinions with us. Um, so I don't know, Hilda, is that it? Can we, are we done here? Is that it? Is it lunchtime? Not for you guys, it isn't. I just uh, uh, put um, the email addresses in the chat so that people can contact us. And you have also the link there to the review page. And Akim has, has kindly volunteered to, to deal with direct email. So if you feel comfortable talking to Akim, email him directly, that's fine. Or say, if you send something to the Google Groups email, that will come to, to um, all of the people who are sort of handling comments on the committee. So I think everybody on the committee is on that group actually. Um, and I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. And thank you very much for your attention and for listening to us. And we would be interested also in feedback on this presentation, what should be in there, what we missed, what could be better explained and so on. So please write to us either about the presentation or, or about the specification. Indeed. Thank you, everybody. Review our spec. Review our spec. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.